Welcome back to another episode of 40 Facts About the 40K Universe. I am your host, Gersh1, and today we're going to be talking about how even the simple animals and creatures of Warhammer 40K are extremely grim, dark, and just scary. If you're new to the channel, subscribe. We post Warhammer 40K lore videos every single day. If you have any suggestions, comment down below. But with that said, let's get into 40 Facts on the creatures of Warhammer 40K. The Razorwing is a large avian creature native to many worlds of the Imperium. It is the size of a mythical Terran hawk and is known to be a particularly effective and vicious aerial predator that hunts in packs. The creature is known to be an incredibly fast flyer. Bit capture shows flocks of razor wings actually outpacing low flying aircraft for short periods of time. The claws and beaks of the razor wing are strong enough to cleave through the mass of its prey to get to the bones inside, but these are not the only weapons that the razor wing employs. The feathers of an avian, from the fellow plumes on its head to the feathers on its tail, are as sharp and durable as monoblades. Imperial scholars think this may be due to excessive amounts of calcium in the razor wing's diet, as the beasts are known to especially delight in crushing and eating the bones of their victims, as well as the flesh. This means the entirety of the razor wing is essentially a weapon. Corpse crawlers are large worm-like parasites found mainly on cemetery worlds. They make their way into dead bodies, wrapping their grotesque forms throughout the corpse's innards and around its spine. Crawlers are able to motivate the invaded body using bioelectrical jolts, animating it like a horrid decaying puppet. For unknown reasons, they seem to prefer the corpses of sentient beings. Instinct drives them to gather and use the host's body to dig a large pit in the soil, wearing hands down to the bone in the process. Once finished, the creatures then direct their host inside, where the crawlers release a caustic acid that putrefies the corpses in minutes. The creature gestates in the rotten swamp of liquefied flesh and floating bones, growing fat and bloated. Finally, the worm bursts, each releasing dozens of spawn to grow until ready to seek their own host corpse, leaving behind nothing but a pile of sticky bones. When a corpse crawler is obstructed in its instinctual mission, it fights back, using its host's body, with strange, jerking motions. If threatened, it could also spray its acid, usually from the host's mouth, to inflict terrible damage. If deprived of corpses, the creatures wrap themselves around skeletons and hibernate until disrupted, or they sense decaying flesh. If they cannot find corpses to inhabit, the desperate creatures attack the living, favoring the sick and decrepit, and attacking with lamprey-like mouths filled with dozens of sharp, jagged teeth. Vicious predators, Scargulls, are the stuff of nightmares for any Voidfarer of the Imperium. They are winged carnivores with a tough outer carapace, usually a flecked gray color. Scargulls have no eyes, and even their maul of razor-sharp teeth is hidden behind their shell until they attack. The exoskeleton allows them to survive extended periods of time in hard void by entering a state of hibernation. In addition to their teeth and long, sharp claws, Scargulls have a long tail ending with a hooked spike of bone capable of piercing armor. They often use these to hitch a ride on a spacefarer's outer hull, the tail puncturing metal and latching the beast securely. After such a long journey, Scargulls are ravenously hungry and attack anything they can find. They leave nothing behind for their prey, even devouring bones and clothing. This can make their presence difficult to detect, with the only evidence being a string of mysterious crew disappearances and unexplained hull breaches. For mysterious reasons, Scargulls are attracted to artificial structures, posing a danger for void ships and even hive cities. It is also not known where these creatures originated or how they came to be. Over time, populations have established themselves on certain orbitals and even particular void ships. Aboard a vessel with a known infestation, crews must be wary when entering seemingly empty holds, at least a hungry Scargull swoops from above. These vessels are considered ill omen by the Void Station and the Planetary Port for obvious reasons. Across the many sectors of the Imperium, native plant life, both ordinary and exotic, covers most worlds. As with the animal life of the Imperium, the plants can be deadly, some deceptively so. On barren worlds, what might lurk in the dark oceans remains unknown. Inside hive cities, endless fungal species dominate within the iron walls. Many underhive areas are lit by the luminescent tendrils that line forgotten passages like ghostly fingers. One of these exotic plant lives is known as the boneweed. Found primarily on the agri-world of Kalto, this vine 
takes its name from its hard, segmented internal structure. The parasite takes root alongside other plants, coiling around them as it grows. It robs other plants of sunlight, but worse, uses vicious barbs to pierce victim plants, siphoning away nutrients. A single vine can spread across a wide field, disseminating crops. Most disturbing is the effect boneweed has on animal life. Those that come near succumb to violent psychosis, becoming mindlessly homicidal. This has resulted in many costly incidences, including the death of a great many animal stock and several massacres involving agri-workers. The plant is also believed to be the cause of incidences in other systems, where it has taken root on other planets. It is unknown where this species came from. Some even fear its introduction was a deliberate act of xeno-sabotage against the Imperium, and that the plant might even be unnatural in origin. Even deadlier plant life is the mind mold. Of the many hazards on the frontier world, few are as insidious as the strain of parasitic fungus simply known as mind mold. Aside from some minor respiratory irritation, the first sign of infection after inhaling its spores is a terrible rash, with presages the appearance of tube-like growths that slowly and painfully tear their way through the skin. The fungus enters the brain and the infected individual begins to exhibit increasingly erratic behavior before his body shuts down. Soon, the mind mode completes its life cycle when a buildup of gases causes the victim's head to burst, scattering new spores everywhere. Psychers seem especially susceptible, and the fungus attacks them more rapidly, disrupting use of their weapons with more horrible results should they perish. When a psyker's brain explodes, it also disperses the mold's warp presence somehow infecting the other psychers far out of range of the psychic spores. Mutation has plagued humanity even before the creation of the Imperium itself, and while man does everything in its power to eradicate the malevolent mutants that rise up amongst every planetary population, very little attention is placed on the non-human organisms that live alongside them. This lack of concern towards animal mutations has given a rodent species native to the hive world of Desilum in the Ascalon sector, the opportunity to grow and prosper from its mutations. Known by the few locals that have encountered the semi-intelligent rodents, the smelt rats are a strange and mysterious species. Sometimes referred to as smelters or scav rats, these abominations were thought to have been created by an individual or organization for some malevolent purpose. But seeing as these rats flourish on their own, it is difficult to assume that a force other than mutation has created these creatures. Most likely, this species was once a typical hive rat that slowly mutated and evolved into a much larger and dangerous menace. Smelt rats can be as large as an ancient Terran dog with razor sharp teeth, long tails, and sharp claws. But what sets these creatures apart from the more dangerous underhive beasts is their cybernetic components. Smelt rats are intelligent and able to augment themselves to become deadlier in combat. Bionic eyes, reinforced tails, and metallic claws are some of the few common augmentations worn by these robotic rodents. While the augmentations are poorly designed, there are some smelters that are completely covered in steel. What's very peculiar about the smelt rats is that they actively avoid humans and inhabit the deep abandoned parts of the underhive, only coming out of their lairs when in need of bionic parts. These stolen cybernetics are then used to augment more of their population. When scav rats hunt, they target individuals that possess the most cybernetics, like members of the Adeptus Mechanicus. Never attacking alone, these rats form swarms that erupt into a frenzy, attacking in overwhelming waves of gnawing teeth, wiring servos, and chain-bladed claws. Once the smelt rat has brought down an individual, they rip every machine part from its body and leave the fleshy bits behind. Mangled carcasses of servitors have been found on numerous occasions with signs that even the wires have been gnawed off to the bone. There is no signs of chaotic taint connected to smelt rats, placing some individuals at ease over their existence, believing that they are simply a nuisance that should be exterminated, but not a great risk to the Imperium. Exterminating these creatures has proved difficult as they are extremely resilient to poisons. Unfortunately, some reports of these creatures have been rumored on other planets in the Ascalon sector, quite possibly stowing away on ships and spreading through the sector. 
No motive other than looting of cybernetics has been detected as of yet, but they might just be building up their forces and waiting for the right opportunity to make their presence known. Encounters have been reported where the smelt rats are led by a leader of sorts. So-called smelt rat kings, these are made up of numerous rats fused together in hideous and unnatural ways. Such tales speak of dozens or even hundreds of individual creatures conjoined by artificial components with tails, wires, and cables tangled together and cemented with rust and filth. Each rat in this conglomeration gives up a part of their individual free will and creates some kind of justal intelligence capable of moving with a single-minded purpose. The sand tiger is a xeno species and a ferociously dangerous ambush predator native to the world of Vaprios on the far edge of the heathen stars in the Coronis Expanse, a parched bronze world dotted by brilliant and poisonous turquoise and cyan seas. Roughly half the size of a man, the sand tiger is a ferocious and solitary predator. Its semi-silicate physical composition allows it to survive the nearly waterless environment it lives in going for Terran months or even years without any liquid besides that which it can take from its prey. The sand tiger is an ambush predator, burrowing itself in dunes 2-3 to three meters below the ground. Once it has dug its burrow, it agitates the sand around it with its powerful digging claws, loosening it. Then it waits, using a multitude of bristling hairs along its back to sense minute vibrations in the desert sand. If an individual is unfortunate enough to walk over the place where the creature is buried, it sinks into the loose and shifting sands, the sand tiger hastening its descent with further frantic digging. Soon the prey finds itself in a conical pit with the sand tiger's hungry maw at the bottom. The creature descends on its prey and shreds it with its claws and circular toothed ringed orifice, draining it of bodily fluids before eating the choice bits of meat and leaving the rest to rot beneath the sands. The sand tiger prefers to wait for its prey to fall into its trap before attacking. It savagely tears into anything that ends up in the pit it has dug, only fleeing if severely wounded. If the prey escapes the pit trap, a hungry or enraged sand tiger pursues them away from its nest. In this case, it prefers to burrow underground to attack from beneath the sands, but runs on open ground if need be. Prey is often scarce in the desert so a sand tiger may pursue a target for dozens of kilometers before giving up. If on the other hand, the sand tiger's prey attacks it from a particularly advantageous position, for example from the lip of its own pit with ranged weaponry, the creature flees quickly, burrowing into the sand to escape attack. The sand tiger is always an ambush predator primarily and prefers to avoid a straight up fight. Despite the ferociousness and elusive nature of the creature, the real draw to Imperial game hunters and adventurers is rooted in the sand tiger's semi-silicate nature. The creature's skeleton is composed entirely of translucent, rose-tinted crystals, comprising of a molecular structure that no member of the Adeptus Mechanicus has been able to replicate. The haunting beauty and utter rarity of the sand tiger's skeleton makes it an exquisite and highly valued trophy. A single tooth or claw is incredibly valuable. A complete skeleton could buy a fury interceptor. The risk one takes to kill these beasts while leaving the skeleton intact only increases their value. Even if the skeleton is unharmed in the effort, removing it from the flesh is extremely difficult as the two bond at a near molecular level, possibly part of how the crystalline bones are formed. Attempts to grow the creature in captivity have failed as even those captured and bred on their home planet to ensure nothing is remiss in the special sands or atmospheres have still proven useless for exploitation. The beasts grow normally, but never form their signature silicate endoskeleton, only soggy bones that easily break into segments of pulpy flesh. One of the most popular stories told by Voidfarers is that of the tale of Magos Dunbane. The Thulian Explorator is said to have traveled to Vaporius, where he became enthralled by the biological makeup of the wildlife there. The semi-silicate nature of certain native creatures such as the dwellers in the heights interested him, but the crystalline skeleton of the sand tiger truly fascinated the Magos biologist. He spent weeks in the cities of various Vaporian priest kings, boring them no end with his experiments and postulations. 
Finally, desperate to be rid of the tiresome tech priest, one of the priest kings sponsored an expedition into the deep desert, so Dune Bane might find his specimen. The tales all agree that Dune Bane found the Sand Tigers, and became convinced that he could use a sonic amplifier to resonate with their crystalline bones, drawing them from great distances to the machine. The last anyone heard of him, he was traveling into the deepest dune seas, seeking a suitable site to test his device. His arranged transport finally departed without him, but curiously, was later paid the balance of the agreed-on fee, along with a substantial bonus. Of course, most assume this is a simple story, designed to get a few free drinks from the gullible in the Calixis sector, eager for tales of the fearsome and dangerous Coronis Expanse. Some hold it contains a measure of truth, and several expeditions have nearly been organized to seek out Dunebane's last resting place. A sand tiger lure would seem to be a guaranteed way to make immense profit, if one ignored the dangers of hundreds of ravenous predators converging on his location. The Diablodon is a reptilian creature of immense power and strength, terrifying and dangerous if encountered in the wild, and incredibly ferocious in captivity. Native to the world of Arum within the Jericho Reach, the Diablodon has managed to find his way across the larger portion of this area of space and beyond. Known within the legends and lore of various tribes and people of Arum, the Diablodon is a consummate hunter and a frightening predator beast. It figures prominently in the native culture and the best hunters are those who have managed to best one of these terrifying lizards. On their native planet, Diablodons are considered to be the ultimate predator. Other than humans, there is little that can threaten a Diablodon. Their biggest concern is competition from others of their own species. They are descended from the reptilian strain of Midasaurs. While some Midasaurs have been domesticated by the people, many more are not. These range from small and virtually harmless species to the massive Diablodons themselves. Found scattered across the numerous worlds within the Jericho Reach, Diablodons have been distributed by many rogue traders and free captains for a variety of reasons, some deliberate and others by accident. They feature popularly within many of the legendary beast trades and tournament arenas for obvious reasons. Diablodons play a significant role in the culture and mythology of the native Aruans. In some of the outlying tribes, the Diablodon is believed to represent the true spirit of the hunter. Dances, performances, and literature have all centered on this terrifying creature. The bones of these beasts are revered and wearing a piece of Diablodon, such as a claw or tooth, is reserved for royalty. The most prominent role these reptiles play is in the Uruan's divested hunt. The truest test of the huntsman's skill, the divested hunt, involves tracking, stalking, and then killing one of these great monsters. So voracious and skillful are Diablodons that those who attempt the divested hunt rarely return. Once the reptile is found, it must be killed and its carcass ritually prepared. This is easier said than done, for these creatures possess a keen intellect and refuse to be taken down easily. As terrifying as the Diablodon is, there are many myths and legends surrounding it. On a room, the most significant one revolves around the Diablodon as a harbinger of death. In the human cultures of Arum, the Diablodon is portrayed as a psychopomp, the being who ferries the dead to the afterlife. Many young hunters also choose to tattoo the Diablodon's image on their bodies, as they believe having the symbol of the monster allows them to channel a small part of its strength and animal cunning. With the return of the Imperium and the Aculus Crusade, this practice has spread throughout some of the regiments of the Imperial Guard. Much to the dismay of the Departamental Munitorum, Diablodons are fearsome looking reptiles. They all have a distinctive crimson hide that had spectacular patterns and streaked into the scales. A typical Diablodon sports a crest and massive needle-like teeth. Their eyes are glistening yellow orbs and their talons are so long and as sharp as Imperial Power Swords. Diablodons have a hunched over stance walking on their two hind legs. Adults stand as tall as an Adeptus Astarte dreadnought. They have a distinctive three-toed track that hunters quickly learn to recognize. The talons and claws of a Diablodon are almost always covered in the gore and remains of past victims. 
Thus, any wound inflicted by a Diablodon inevitably turns septic unless treated. Diablodons prefer to dwell within caves or other subterranean places, especially those that are near volcanic or geothermal areas. This preference not only adds to their mystique, but also provides additional protection from potential predators. One of the obvious signs that a Diablodon lair is near is the grisly pile of leftover carcasses and split bones. The reptile isn't one to finish its meal entirely. Evidence supports that the Diablodon are excellent night hunters, leading some to believe that they possess both superior night vision and a heightened sense of smell. An unusual trait in Diablodons is the fact that they are not pack hunters, preferring to hunt on their own. In fact, the Diablodon will go out of its way to remove any competition from its hunting grounds. While their mating habits are unknown, it is speculated that a Diablodon will only tolerate the presence of another until the female has been fertilized. She will then leave the area and either locate a suitable place to lay her eggs, near a volcanic vent if possible, or return to her own hunting grounds. Members of the Mechanicus Adeptus Biologus suspect that the male is one who initiates the mating ritual by extending his crest to lure the female in. However, it is not unusual or unheard of for male Diablodons to do this as a means to reduce competition for food sources by attacking the potential mate instead of propagating. The Killian's Bane is one of the most fearsome predators of the scattered wetlands of the infamous death world of Burnscour in the Coronis Expanse. The creature gained its now infamous name many standard years ago when the rogue trader Augustus Killian, the beast hunter famed across the Calixian sector and into the depths of the Expanse, took his leave on Burnscour to show off his prowess to a gathering of the sector's nobolites shimmering behind protective power fields. He claimed to possess a new Archaeotech discovery that he would unveil, though exactly what it was he would not say, other than it would result in a spectacular display. Killian confidently strode to the nearby water's edge, wielding only his family's heirloom power saber. He then produced an oddly shaped crystalline object, which shone with white blue light as he waved it over his head to the crowd's delight. Vid captures recovered later show faces quickly turning to terror as a worm larger than ever seen before rose out of the swamp and far above the trees. For a long dreadful moment, nothing moved except for the swamp water dripping onto the stunned trader. Then it fell to take Killian between jaws, now stretched wide enough to swallow a lander. Theories vary if the mysterious device had somehow summoned the beast from the depths, or was designed to help him vanquish it, or perhaps protect him somehow. He was simply gone in a moment as the beast dove back into his dank home, the massive tail carelessly shattering the power field generator and plasteel tents surrounding the panicked crowd. Some insisted that Killian glowed an unearthly metallic sheen in the brief moment before he was engulfed but this was never sustained in the vid capture. House Killian was suddenly ruined in a single day, losing not only their master, but also the ancient and invaluable warrant of trade he had always famously carried in a small stasis cylinder on his wide sash as a point of pride. Many explorers have since also lost their lives attempting to find the creature, knowing that inside is not only what could be a priceless device, but also an actual warrant, which would allow them to establish their own dynasty. The tale spread throughout Port Wander's many taverns, and from there into the Calixis sector, and soon the notoriety made it a creature in high demand for its illicit fighting pits and beast arenas across the region. Seeing their favorite gladiator eaten alive and then betting if they can escape before perishing is often a highlight of much such affairs. The creature's dorsal spikes are often covered with clumps of moss and other vegetation, giving the serpent a more shaggy appearance than other scaled creatures possess. Tech priests of the Adeptus Mechanicus Xenobiologist have observed specimens deliberately diving through thick flora to drag away clumps. These plants provide a natural disguise, enough to help them stalk their prey and fool most of the larger predators. The mouth is perhaps the beast's most distinctive feature, 
as the jaws are only connected to the rest of the creature's skeleton with long, elastic bands of sinew and muscle. This allows the beast to open its maw extraordinarily wide, letting it swallow even the oversized creatures of Burnscour. Those it cannot swallow, it bites apart with rows of powerful fangs, each strike able to tear away huge swaths of flesh. The creature is amphibious, preferring areas with calm water, though some have been sighted along deep rivers. It can breathe underwater for extended durations, but maintains most of its life either floating across swamp lakes or slithering across the ground. Beastmasters from the sector have tracked some of the banes several kilometers from the wetlands, either stalking prey or moving to new habitats, indicating that they can survive out of the water for long periods as well. For a primarily water-based creature, it can move with surprising speed across dry land and is fast enough to run down many beasts. Most banes are relatively sedentary, calmly gliding across the stagnant waterways with occasional dives to search for prey swimming beneath them. A bane normally attacks in a swift motion, ideally attempting to engulf the quarry in a single stroke. The attack is terrifying as the bane can rear up to a towering height as part of its lunge. If near water, it also endeavors to swallow as much liquid as possible at the same time. This accomplishes two things, helping drown its victim but also allowing the bane to settle rapidly to the bottom of the swamp, safely obscured from other predators. If on land or attacking aquatic life, the bane's powerful musculature steps in to help crush the life from its prey. Once subdued, the bane regurgitates the remains to rip them into more digestible chunks and then swallows them again. Luckily for those creatures sharing its habitat, a bane feeds relatively infrequently and a single large meal lasts it for more than a solar day. Banes reproduce by releasing huge swarms of tiny offspring mere centimeters in length into the swamp, where most are quickly eaten by other predators. Even these miniature banes are dangerous though, as if they are not killed when consumed, they can continue to grow and eventually bore their way out via their serrated teeth. These small progeny often attach onto larger creatures leeching off blood and flesh until large enough to drop off and eat on their own. A crotolid is a large semi-aquatic carnivore found throughout the human settled galaxy that prefers to live in and around tropical and subtropical rivers. They are dangerous reptile beasts with long scaly bodies carried on stubby powerful legs capable of driving them forward with surprising bursts of speeds over short distances. A long, thin tail drags behind the creature on land, leaving distinctive tracks, but in the water, a crotolid propels its whole body with powerful flicks of its tail. The crotolid's head is dominated by a ferocious jaw filled with serrated rows of triangular teeth. These teeth never stop growing throughout the crotolid's life. The crotolid's feeding grounds can be easily identified by the gnawed rocks and tree trunks found in the vicinity. Despite this, instances have been reported of dead crotolids that were killed by their teeth growing so long that they finally pierced the creature's own tiny brains. Aside from such examples of autophagia, crotolids are protected by thick scales and a rudimentary nervous system that makes them extremely difficult to kill outright. Once injured or exposed to the scent of blood, Crotolids enter a kind of feeding frenzy which overrides any kind of pain or fear response, sending them into a berserker attack of thrashing limbs and snapping jaws. Crotolids are primarily ambush predators, feeding on fish, other aquatic animals, and wildlife drinking at the water's edge. Crotolids favor attacking from submerged locations and clamping their formidable jaws onto a victim before they have a chance to react but they will also pursue prey a short distance out of the water, dragging it back to their aquatic home at the first opportunity. Crotolids are also opportunistic and will quickly investigate any disturbance in the water, especially kills by other crotolids, in hopes of snatching a mouthful or two for themselves in the resulting frenzy. A full-grown crotolid could easily overwhelm a man and can even give a space marine a difficult fight. 
Unfortunately, crotalids often appear in large numbers, quickly making their way to the top of the food chain and completely dominating the area they inhabit. As such, any encounter with one crotalid means that several more will soon arrive, and in the heavily infested area, dozens can appear in a moment. Crotalids in captivity have lived over 70 Terran years, but Adeptus Mechanicus, Magi, Biologists, Xenologists have been unable to determine the lifespan of a crotalids in the wild. This is due to their curious migratory habits, which are at best determined unique in the known galaxy. As a rapidly expanding population of crotalids comes to dominate a region, their prey is completely exhausted in the course of a few standard decades. The crotalid population must now migrate to a new location or face extinction, and the creature instinctively gathers in response to their growing hunger. At some undetermined point, the unconscious desire of the crotalids enables them to move on, not by walking or swimming, but by passing through the immaterium itself. How crotalids perform this feat is still unknown, as autopsies have revealed no organ or abnormality that might give the beast the ability to pass through the warp. Certainly, no conscious manipulation of the process seems available to the crotalids themselves, as they can appear on worlds quite unsuited for them, including desert planets and even airless worlds. Nonetheless, migratory packs of crotalids can appear on worlds up to 10 light years from their original point, and have been highly successful in establishing themselves in new environments through their apparent hit and miss process. Crotalids have been found all over the galaxy, but the densest concentration of sightings are clustered around the death world of Lost Hope. Tracking migratory packs has proven impossible, as has keeping more than three crotalids together in captivity. However, it appears that once a population migrates, it will not do so again for several standard decades, for the impetus seems to be driven by population pressure. Although observations of this phenomenon is limited to finding evidence of failed migrations, crotalids appearing on a world poorly suited to them do not seem to be able to move on to greener pastures using this remarkable trait. For some, this reinforces the prevalent theory that the crotalid's ability is not consciously used, but an instinctual response to environmental pressures. A typical migratory pack comprises anywhere up to a hundred or more fully grown crotalids and can cause considerable damage. When they arrive in a new hunting ground, crotalids are extremely aggressive and will attack anything in sight to establish their dominance. Frontier colonies have been all but wiped out by such unexpected appearances, with livestock and outlying farms paying the highest price in a sudden invasion by large carnivorous reptiles. The pleasure world of Kolinica was entirely ravaged by large numbers of crotalids, multiplying in its picturesque river deltas to the point where they threaten high-born pleasure seekers on the beaches. Conversely, some crotalid populations are actively hunted or even farmed on certain worlds. Crotalid meat is tough and unappetizing, but their hides and teeth have some value. Hunting crotalids for sport has some notoriety among the high society, but it is more commonly preserved for the desperate men. Bait and traps are the clever way to kill a crotalid, preferably by getting it out of the water first. The Mukali are a species of non-sentient Xenos animals utilized by the Talaran Desert Raiders Imperial Guard Regiment's specialized Rough Rider squadrons as a mount and beast of burden. The Mukali, sometimes locally referred to as sand pacers, originated in the vast equatorial deserts of the Imperial world of Goru Prime, but have since been imported to other Imperial Desert worlds, such as Talaran because of their superbly adaptable biology to desert environments. In these arid regions, the beasts thrive like no other, able to live for long stretches without either food or water. Their skin is exceptionally dense and acts both as an insulator from external heat and a barrier to prevent interior moisture from escaping. The hide protects powerful muscles designed more for duration than sprinting, but still capable of reaching good speeds over short distances. Unlike other creatures that metabolize stored fat to provide energy, the Mukali's metabolism is acutely efficient and can extract nourishment to an extraordinary degree. 
They are grazers, living on a traditionally thin diet of tough shrubs and other sparse desert vegetation, which they chew and regurgitate through multiple stomachs and digestive organs, some beginning in their bulky necks. Each organ extracts more and more moisture and nourishment, allowing the creature to sustain itself far longer on far less than would be expected for its size. One of the major dangers in caring for the creature is overfeeding, for their digestion can be easily overwhelmed with unpleasant results. Indigestion, upset stomach, diarrhea. A mukali can survive for long periods on very small amount of food and water, easily outlasting a human or even the sturdiest pack animal. Conversely, they have very poor protection against cold climates and die quickly when exposed to sub-zero temperatures of any length of time. A Mukali's main advantage over a Terran horse is its exceptional endurance and load-bearing capabilities. In the driest of hot desert conditions, they can keep going for days, even without food or water, and will long outlive a horse or even their human rider. A Mukali's feet are adapted to move over sand at a surprising speed. Large, soft pads, similar to those of a Terran camel, help spread their weight to prevent their sinking into soft sand. Their thick hides generally have a mottled gray-blue coloring, running to a pink-brown underbelly. Standing easily over 2 meters tall at the shoulders, Mukali are hairless, quasi-reptilian beasts. Their tough, thick hide hangs in great folds, and it is strong enough not only to provide protection from predators, but also offer a limited defense against weapons. Their sloped back and long necks leave a perfect spot for a rider atop the Mukali's shoulders. And while their gait is somewhat odd in appearance, their long legs allow them to travel at considerable speeds. Mukali have relatively small heads, barely broader than their thick neck, which are almost completely flat and featureless. From a distance, it is difficult to even identify the small, deep-set eyes and nostril holes. Due to their size and gait, Mukali require a completely different approach to handling than that of a horse, more commonly used by a rough rider. Those riders willing to learn are rewarded with a dependable and durable beast of burden, capable of handling much heavier loads than other comparable mounts, a creature perfectly suited for long operations behind enemy lines. The Mukali have existed on the feral world of Nadwesh in the Coronis Expanse for many generations, imported long ago by clever rogue traders who realized they were a perfect fit for the wide areas of dry desert climate on their world. Here they quickly became part of the native culture, acting as personal transports, beasts of burden, and even food, should conditions demand the desperate act. Overall, they have adapted very well, creating a slightly new strain unique to the world. Breeders on Nadwesh discovered that if the Mukali were not allowed to breed in the wild, they are even more cowardly and timid than usual, barely suited for anything but the mildest of burden duties, and even then, they may run away when startled. For this reason, many herds are allowed to breed in the open plains, with herdsmen deployed to watch over them to protect them from poachers or other dangers. As needed, stock is culled from these wild herds for training and resale to buyers across the Coronis Expanse and beyond. The beasts are a common trading item and source for income for many Nadwashi tribes. Many experienced hunters travel from the Calixis sector to pick steeds to carry them on their latest expeditions, and colonists purchase entire herds as they prepare to migrate to the drier or hotter planets they intend to make home. They have also been seen in the use among several planetary defense forces as military mounts, but less frequently in mercantile or mercenary bands. One infamous Imperial Guard Brontean Long Knives platoon even somehow arranged for a herd to stampede into enemy lines shocking their foes long enough for the guardsmen to overrun their flattened enemies. And those were 40 facts on the creatures of the 40k universe. I hope you guys enjoyed this video. Uh, if you guys have suggestions for any other topics, please comment down below. And um, yeah, I'll talk to you guys tomorrow. This is Gershwan with One Mind Syndicate signing out. <laughs>